From Colombia's indigenous Banela and India's Bilona ghee to Kenya's single-origin coffee and Japan's olive wagyu, we uncovered the stories behind some of the world's most expensive foods. Our first stop is in Indonesia, where the largest communities of one of the rarest lobsters on the planet exist. These colorful crustaceans are more than six times as expensive as main lobsters. This lobster is so valuable that people try to smuggle its larvae across international waters. The ornate tropical rock lobster, or the pearl lobster as it's better known, can cost nearly $100 a kilogram, making it six times as expensive as other popular varieties, like Maine lobsters. The colorful crustacean is one of the rarest and priciest lobsters you can find. But what makes the pearl lobster so special? And why exactly is it so expensive? Pearl lobsters are found throughout the Indian Ocean and West Pacific, but the waters around Indonesia are where their largest communities exist. They're known for their blue-green shells, rainbow-colored spots, and extra-long antennae. Pearl lobsters are also meatier and sweeter than other lobsters. In Ikas Bay, Indonesia, they're considered a popular delicacy and sold for a hefty profit. Rasanya ini yang mungkin membuatnya populer dari lobster yang lain. Rasanya itu agak-agak manis dan woi gurih, enak dan kalau digoreng itu rasanya pokoknya mantap dah. Abdul Kasim has been fishing for lobsters for 29 years. Whenever it's not too windy, he takes his boat to rocky locations that could be home to pearl lobsters. Kita belajar menangkap lobster ini uh, sejak apa diajarkan oleh orang tua. Ini kalau kita bilang turun temurun. Bagian tersulitnya adalah ketika kita menentukan lokasinya. Terkadang lokasi yang sudah kita gunakan itu mungkin di sana habis. Kemudian kita harus mencari lokasi yang baru lagi untuk menangkap lobster. The fishers leave their nets out overnight and return in the morning. They also catch sand lobsters, but pearl lobsters are worth a lot more. Seperti kalau harga dari lobster mutiara itu satu juta, itu kalau perbandingan untuk pasir itu palinglah lima ratus, lima ratus ribu. Oleh sebab itu kalau di bulan Januari sampai Februari itu nyampe dia sampai satu juta, satu juta lima ratus ribu per kilogram untuk yang alam. Sementara di bulan lain mungkin berkisar antara satu juta atau satu juta seratus lima puluh itu saja. Any lobsters that are large enough to be sold are brought to a seller. Due to government regulations, pearl lobsters that weigh less than 200 grams must be brought to a breeder. Breeders like Murdim raise pearl lobsters in captivity. This method ensures a more reliable supply of lobsters. Saya tertarik karena hasilnya sangat uh, mendukung untuk uh, keluarga kami, keluarga saya gitu untuk membiayai sekolah anak saya dan kebutuhan lain-lainnya. But keeping them healthy is no easy feat. The lobster larvae, or seeds as they're called, are placed in nets that float directly in the ocean, exposed to natural elements. Murdim takes his boat out to feed the lobsters every day. It takes 18 months to fully breed pearl lobster seeds. Ya memang agak sulit dan agak susah mutiara apa? Lobster mutiara itu dibudidayakan karena agak rentan apa namanya? Penyakitnya mudah kena diserang penyakit lah gitu dan eh, terlalu mahal bibitnya juga. The lobsters are also often attacked by pufferfish and barracudas, who eat their legs. If a lobster loses two legs from the same side, it's considered defective and can't be sold. Ya biasa kita kerjakan kita lepas 50 ekor yang 50 gram itu kita lepas 50 ekor yang satu jaring terus sampai pemanenan gitu sekitar 40 ekoran itu sekitar 10 persen dah mbak. The surviving lobsters will grow from 50 grams to the preferred selling weight of 500 grams. To help protect their lobsters, breeders check on the nets throughout the week and repair any damage. 
It's a lot of work, but it's worth it, since pearl lobsters have become one of the most valuable resources at Indonesian fisheries. To help strengthen the country's lobster farming industry, the Indonesian government has banned the export of all lobster larvae. This measure is also meant to protect its wild lobster populations. However, theft and international smuggling attempts of Indonesia's lobster larvae have not stopped. Back in autumn 2022, authorities caught smugglers transporting $2.2 million worth of lobster larvae. The Indonesian government estimates that the country lost more than $64 million in revenue to illegal exports in 2019. The demand for Indonesian lobsters, particularly pearl lobsters, is very high in countries like Singapore, China and Vietnam. Pearl lobsters aren't even always available in Indonesia. Tidak juga sih, tidak semua menjual lobster mustiara. Satu kualitasnya memang dia bagus, juga yang paling mahal di atas rata-rata. Yang membeli lobster mutiara itu biasanya orang-orang yang pengunjung, pendatang, baik lokal, domestik, ataupun juga orang-orang luar negeri. Many restaurants and hotels also buy pearl lobsters, driving up the demand and prices. The time of year impacts how expensive a pearl lobster will be as well. Lobsters are more expensive in January and February because of all the Chinese New Year celebrations. Prices are also higher from August to September, when international tourists come to visit. During these months, captive pearl lobsters sell for around $50 per kilogram, and wild pearl lobsters can sell for as much as $75 per kilogram. Wild pearl lobsters are always more expensive because they tend to be larger than their captive counterparts. They also weigh more, even when they're the same size, so there's more meat to enjoy. Untuk skala rasa, saya lebih memilih lobster mutiara ya dibandingkan lobster yang Pakistan dan lainnya. Dan harganya juga sepadan dengan rasa lobster mutiara itu tersendiri. Pada dasarnya lobster semua sama, tapi bagi saya mungkin lobster mutiara ini lebih empuk dan enak juga ya untuk dirasa. Despite the extravagant cost, one of the most popular ways to eat pearl lobster is grilling it as a local outdoor restaurant. Ya, saya cukup uh, lumayan sering mengkonsumsi lobster mutiara sebulan sekali mungkin atau sebulan dua kali. Saya biasa juga saya bawa ke restoran untuk dibakar atau uh, saya bawa pulang ke rumah untuk digoreng dengan bumbu sendiri. Lobster mutiara memiliki tekstur uh, yang empuk di lidah dan dagingnya tebal juga memiliki rasa manis lah. But despite pearl lobster's popularity in Indonesia and throughout Asia, its price has actually fallen over the years. And its fluctuating value is concerning for the people whose livelihoods depend on it. Uh, harapan kami sebagai nelayan lobster di sini kepada pemerintah untuk stabilasi, eh, stabilkan harga. Kita cuma butuh harga di sini untuk distabilkan. Jangan sampai harganya terlalu anjlok dan drop. Karena kita juga uh, butuh keuangan yang cukup untuk memenuhi segala kebutuhan keluarga. High-end foie gras, or fattened goose liver, is a costly and controversial fine dining staple. And this foie gras is six times as expensive. Here in Extremadura, Spain, Eduardo Sosa is one of the few people in the world making what his supporters call ethical foie gras. Toma, bonita, toma. Toma, 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 toma. Toma, toma, bonita, toma. Many consider foie gras to be unethical because it's typically made by force feeding ducks or geese to fatten their livers. Eduardo does things differently and it makes his product incredibly pricey. A 180 gram jar costs over $200. But what exactly makes this foie gras ethical? And why is it so expensive? Eh, mi familia lleva haciendo este sistema desde que sepamos nosotros el año 1812 y desde entonces no hemos parado. Nuestro foie se produce pues de una forma muy sencilla. Nosotros tenemos eh, una serie de gansos eh, eh, salvajes domesticados. When the weather turns cold and the bird migration season begins, wild geese join the tamed geese on Eduardo's farm. Here the geese feast upon grass, acorns, olives, figs, and different seeds. Fijaros cómo lo comen. 
y que les encanta la bellota. Instead of force feeding the birds, Eduardo simply relies on the geese's natural behaviors. There are no fences here. The geese are free to come and go as they please. Eduardo says the geese eat more grass when they're free to roam. He says this is essential because the grass apparently makes the acorns taste sweeter to the geese. And the more acorns the geese eat, the tastier and yellower their livers will be. While Eduardo prefers to let the geese eat what they want, he does provide them with organic corn to make their livers more yellow. Hace años nuestro hígado era bueno, era mucho más oscuro que el que es ahora, ¿eh? y entonces por viendo en el mercado que la tendencia era una cosa más amarilla, más blanquita, más tal, pues eh, se nos ocurrió de darle maíz ecológico porque hemos, no, hemos, nos dimos cuenta que dándole maíz ecológico eh, es como un colorante, entonces queda más bonito el hígado, ¿no? el foie. During this time of year, geese stuff themselves full of food to prepare for their winter migration. This quickly builds fat and enlarges their livers, the perfect conditions for creating foie gras. When it's time for the slaughter, Eduardo uses a traditional technique to stun the geese, hypnosis. He says this makes the process as painless as possible. It happens only once a year during the coldest part of winter when the geese have the most fat. It also has to be a moonless night. Pues que localizamos las quedas, ¿no? Donde están los grupos de ganso y luego con luz Vamos con una luz LED muy potente y hacemos que se queden hipnotizados, ¿saben? Las aves cuando le da una luz fuerte pues, pues se quedan quietas y se quedan hipnotizadas. De esa forma las podemos coger fácilmente y además el animal eh, pues no sufre absolutamente nada. Es una, una muerte dulce, como se dice, ¿no? Eduardo's foie gras is so highly sought after because of how flavorful it is. To preserve its unique flavor profile, Eduardo prepares his foie gras very simply. Hemos cogido el horno, le hemos metido leña, lo estamos calentando y luego lo que vamos a hacer ya en estos envases especiales para conserva es calentarlo para que se cocine y como si fuera una cocina normal. ¿Vale? Esto es lo que llamarían los franceses un hígado en tierra. En tierra es mmm, que es una pieza entera del ganso metida en el frasco y cocinado. No tiene mayor historia. No lleva absolutamente nada. Es 100% natural. Y el sabor, pues. Maravilloso. Un sabor muy suave. Una crema, algo increíble, es un sabor extraordinario. Sabe a naturaleza, sabe una mezcla entre bellota, semilla y hierba, un toque dulzón por, el, por los higos y da, pues bueno, es algo único, algo único. El ganso se aprovecha absolutamente todo. ¿eh? Entonces, cuando hacemos el proceso, También aprovechamos las pechugas para hacer este delicioso jamón. Que publicitamos siempre que el foie es algo que se debería consumir una sola vez en la vida. ¿vale? No queremos que se abuse, no es un alimento que por mucho dinero que tenga una persona no debe abusar del consumo. Es algo que, que hay que probar, disfrutarlo en una ocasión muy, muy, muy especial. So despite the high demand, Eduardo won't make more than 2,000 batches a year. He says he's committed to maintaining the wild geese population and heavily discourages overconsumption, unlike most foie gras producers. Bueno, pues la industria eh, lo que ha hecho es aprovechar la capacidad natural del ganso de generar grasa en su hígado, pues para hacerlo industrialmente. Les ponen una temperatura 
¿eh? para que ellos, los gansos se crean que están en invierno, le ponen una, una, un aire acondicionado muy frío, entonces, eh, y le empiezan a dar mucha comida con una, con una máquina que le entra en el estómago y le empiezan a meter, a meter, a meter comida. Pues que le dan de comer muchas veces, muchas veces, muchas veces, eh, durante el día para eh, generar muchísima grasa. Entonces el hígado se le pone bestial, imaginaros, eh, puede llegar a pesar hasta dos kilos el hígado de un ganso, más o menos. Entonces, y eso lo hacen en, en siete, ocho días. ¿Vale? ...cuanto en la naturaleza pues necesita un año, una vida... ...en fin, hay mucha diferencia... Eh, ...la industria ha inventado un, un foie aprovechando los genes del ganso... ...y entonces inventó un animal hecho en laboratorio... ...que es el pato que le llaman pato mular o pato mudo... ...entonces eh, es una, un animal hecho en, en un laboratorio... ¿eh? ...y entonces lo que hace es que lo han hecho mudo para que no moleste... ¿Eh? ...para que no, no esté dando chillos y tal... Y, 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 ...y consiguen un hígado muy grande... ...ese es el foie que come todo el mundo... ...en eh, los restaurantes, en todo el mundo... ...que es lo que hay, es una barbaridad. In recent years, climate change has pushed back... ...the farm's traditional foie gras making timeline. En la época de mi padre, pues eh, los gansos... Eh, ...se elaboraba el producto a finales de octubre... ...y ahora pues nos vamos a... ...noviembre, diciembre, enero... ...incluso algún año en febrero... ...algún año hemos tenido marzo... ...pero bueno, que al final lo importante es que haga frío... ...que, lo, que, la, que las bellotas y las hierbas y todo salgan... ...eso que lo mismo nos da un mes más, un mes menos o dos meses ¿no? Regardless of when it's made... ...Eduardo's foie gras, or natural foie gras as he calls it... ...has an extremely long waiting list every year... There was limited demand for Eduardo's foie gras until 2006, when he and his team won the coveted Coup de Coeur Award at the Seal Food Expo in Paris. Desde entonces eh, comenzó de verdad la, la demanda. Bueno, fue cuando el CIFOG, la, la Asociación de Productores de Foie de Francia, no mm, quiso impugnar el premio diciendo que nuestro foie al ser natural no se podía considerar foie. ...están continuamente poniéndonos demandas y demandas y demandas... ...y están siempre que si el nombre, que si tal... ...entonces para no tener conflicto con ellos... ...siempre decimos que nuestro producto no es foie gras... ...¿vale?... ...de esa forma... ...nosotros ahora le denominamos foie natural gras... ...no foie gras. Despite challenges and criticism from other foie gras producers... ...Eduardo's product has only continued to become more popular. Te doy cuenta que los grandes chefs del mundo... ...los mejores chefs del mundo... ...pues alaban nuestro, el sabor, ¿no? Dicen que es algo increíble... ...tenía el caso del chef Dan Barber en Estados Unidos... ...que dijo que era lo, lo mejor que había probado en su vida, ¿no? la, la experiencia culinaria más grande de su vida... ...porque es que es algo diferente, totalmente. La patería de Susa's natural foie gras... ...costs 199 euros... ...and sells out every year. El precio no creo que baje nunca... ...puesto que mientras se siga produciendo... ...a pequeña escala... ...pues bueno, tenemos que compensar el... El coste de, una, de pocos animales en muchísimo territorio, pues con el precio, es, es algo lógico y normal. Despite the hefty price tag, Eduardo says he doesn't see much of a profit from his foie gras. Geese require more land than other livestock. Most people in his area prefer to raise Iberian pigs, which are very profitable. Por eso la gente, los vecinos, pues no quieren, no tienen mucho interés en criar gansos. A, mí, a nosotros nos ven como un poquito los locos de, del tema. La cría del ganso, pues bueno, es eh, eh, mi pasión, ¿no? Claro, no, lo sí, estoy, es que es, mi, es una pasión, es mi vida, es mi pasión. Pero mi padre me enseñó, yo estoy enseñando a mis hijos y, y lo que queremos es que esto no se pierda, ¿no? Y que la gente, ojalá, saliera más gente a producir ganso. But it wasn't Eduardo's family who invented the natural foie gras tradition. Fueron los hebreos los que vinieron a la península ibérica y trajeron esta cultura del antiguo Egipto, ¿no? Es una forma muy inteligente Primero, de respetar al animal. Segundo, de obtener grasa pues, para, para la cocina. Eh, ellos tenían la, la, la sabia costumbre de instalarse en, eh, la, en los pasos de migración de aves, como es el caso de esta granja. ¿Vale? Entonces, eh, ellos tenían una serie de gansos salvajes domesticados, ¿vale? que domesticaban y que, hacían que, luego, que atraían los gansos silvestres a, a la granja. ¿Vale? ...en épocas de migración... ...pues bueno, tenemos que gracias a, a estas personas... ...desgraciadamente... Eh, ...estas personas judías tuvieron que abandonar España... ...expulsados por los reyes católicos... 
con el famoso decreto de expulsión del año 1492. Nosotros bueno, pues nos quedamos con, con ese legado, con esa sabiduría de estas personas y aquí queda pues, un poquito de su historia. This kilogram of baby eels has just sold for over $7,000. Angulas are the young of the European eel. They're a delicacy in Spain, where every year they're auctioned off for thousands of dollars. But angulas are tiny. Fishers need to catch 3,000 of them to reach one kilo, a task that requires spending entire nights in the water in total darkness, braving strong tides and stormy seas. And while angulas are prized for their crunchy texture, they have a very mild taste, almost non-existent. Lo que hace la angula tan especial es la finura que tiene en boca a la hora de comer. So, who buys baby eels and why are these fish so expensive? It's midnight in Riba de Seja, in the north of Spain. And it's the first day of the baby eel season. Esperemos pescar algo, algo. Mucho, mucho no, porque la, el tiempo no, no vino, no acompañó. Manolo has been fishing eels for the last 33 years. He's one of 46 fishers here in Riba de Seja who are licensed to fish angulas. Tonight marks the beginning of a four-month-long season. Cuando llega la temporada de, de, de la angula, yo me siento muy diferente. Eh, me siento con ansia, me siento nervioso, a pesar de que ya son unos cuantos años, pero todavía noto como, como la primera. The fishing takes place at night when the eels are most active. Miramos los mejores momentos, los más propicios para para la pesca siempre es la la pleamar. The first thing Manolo does is assess the water. Right now, although awake, the eels are hiding in the sand, so he relies on the movement of the water to reveal them. Nosotros lo que bus lo que buscamos es más que nada el sitio donde las olas se juntan, porque Trayendo la angula de un lado, trayendo la angula de otro, las deja siempre en esa zona. To fish, Manolo uses a custom rake called a ceazo. Entonces nosotros metemos el ceazo en, en, en el agua y levantamos antes que venga la, la ola de, de atrás. Es el ceazo bien asentado en el suelo, porque si te queda colgando, la angula que te pasa por abajo no entra en el, en el ceazo. Manolo's timing needs to be spot on. If he lifts the rake one second later than he should, the same wave that pushed the eel into his net can also wash it back into the sea. Cayó, cayó. Estamos a la caza. Even with the right equipment, baby eel fishing has a serious risk of coming back empty-handed. That's because there is one thing Manolo can't predict, the weather. Nada, hoy es un, un día tranquilo, tranquilo, tranquilo. Normalmente esto es muy pocas veces. Lo que tiene que haber es eh, temporal de mar, que haya mucho oleaje, que sean las olas grandes, que arrastre todo el fondo. Tonight is also a full moon. While it may give him some light on this dark beach, it's not ideal, as some eels may confuse it with daytime and stay buried in the sand. Lo que tenemos que buscar es cuanto más oscuro para la angula es mucho mejor. Pues eh, no no va bien la cosa. Bueno, se está acercando la hora, ¿eh? Vamos a cambiar de, de playa. Vamos a ir hasta la playa de San Antolín. This change of beach is a gamble for Manolo. There is no guarantee there will be eels there. That's because much is still unknown about their life cycle. The Angulus' journey starts very far away, in the Sargasso Sea, a region of the Atlantic Ocean close to the Caribbean. There, adult eels spawn and die, and their hatchlings travel through the Gulf Stream until they reach the coast of Spain, seeking fresh water. When they arrive, the Angulus are transparent. As they move out of the salty ocean and into rivers, the higher temperature of the fresh water will turn them from transparent to black as they mature into adult eels. 
Catching them before this transition occurs is essential. But the eel's exact journey is unknown, and it's impossible to predict the number of angulas that will arrive at the start of the season. Estos años de atrás vienen a hacerse pues unos 1.500, 1.700, aunque el año pasado disminuyó drásticamente hasta alcanzar unos 780 kilos aproximadamente. This unpredictability makes Manolo's job even more difficult. Pues con eso si cojo al final de la noche 50 gramos. Ya son. Posiblemente sea el peor comienzo de, de, de hace mucho tiempo. Although the night is not going so well, the eels Manolo finds tonight will be the most expensive of the season. That's because buyers will pay a premium for the first night's catch. Mañana esperemos que tenga un buen precio. Ah, mira, tenemos una. El recorrido me parece que eran sobre 5.000 euros y... Eh, mira, tres. Cuatro. Manolo caught 90 grams tonight. He doesn't know how much it will be worth yet. Before the eels are sold at the auction, workers at Riva de Seja Market clean them with a sponge to remove all the excess water that could affect their weight. 1.4 kilos arrived at the market today, the total catch of all fishers working last night. On a good day, the total catch can weigh five or six kilos. Today's low total will make this auction even more competitive. Bidders for the Angulas are typically restaurants in the area, and the lucky chef who will get to cook the eels is there in person to make the bid. Y cuando llega también la subasta y esa piquilla sana, esos nervios de a ver quién este año va a quedarse con la angula, también hay es emocionante. Manuel is the chef at El Campanú, a restaurant in Riva de Seja. He holds the record for the highest ever bid. His restaurant paid 6,620 euros per kilo in 2019. La subasta eh, del pescado se, se hace se hace a la, a la holandesa. Esto lo que quiere decir es que se pone un precio alto y, y va descendiendo. Desciende de 10 en 10. The auction itself is very quiet. It's done using a screen, and each buyer has a remote control that they use to make their bid. Y sabes quién va a ser el que va a pelear contigo. Aquí tienes que ser un poco lince a la hora de tocar el botón. Manuel made it. He gets to cook the first kilo of angulas of the season for 7,280 euros. That's a new record high. Yo me estaba fijando la persona que iba y yo vi como hubo un movimiento ahí un poco extraño de esa persona hacia la puja y entonces calqué. Quedamos nosotros con la angula este año. Out of the whole batch, those 90 grams that Manolo fished last night were worth 655 euros today. Muy buen precio, muy buen precio, muy contento. La pena es que se pescó poco, claro, por eso el precio que, que tiene. Pero contento, contento, contento. But not all baby eels cost over 7,000 euros. Cost is variable depending on the time of year. That's why for fishers like Manolo, it's impossible to rely on just angula fishing for a living. El primer día, la subasta del primer día, económicamente para para mí no supone mucho. Lo, lo importante son los tres meses y 29 días restantes. Eel fishing here in Riva de Seja is heavily regulated. Fishers like Manolo are only allowed to fish baby eels between November and February, with five mandatory rest days each month. Each fisher needs to hold a license, and certain beaches are no fishing zones. Breaking any of these rules can cost as much as 6,000 euros. These regulations mean that the price of angulas has skyrocketed in recent decades. 
Cuando, cuando empecé a pescar con mi padre, yo llegué a vender la, la angula lo más barato a 8.000, 10.000, 12.000 pesetas de la época. Y ahora en las últimas, las últimas campañas eh, lo llegamos a vender hasta 810. Fue lo máximo que vendí el kilo, 810 euros. In the last 50 years, the demand for the increasingly scarce eels has risen so much that gulas, a cheaper copy of baby eels, were born. Gulas are made of surimi, the same fish paste used to make imitation crab, and cost 62 times less than angulas. They are now just as popular as the real thing. This makes cooking with real baby eels a delicate task for chefs like Manuel. He needs to make sure the subtle taste of the angulas shines through and that they don't lose their texture, or they could be mistaken for their cheap imitation. Angulas can't be cooked alive, because they'll release slime, so Manuel treats them with a tobacco infusion first. Y ahora ya estamos notando como la angula ya empieza a quedar tersa, a quedar más dura, va perdiendo la fuerza según va cogiendo la infusión de tabaco. He then removes the unwanted slime by hand. Por eso este proceso tiene que ser es el más costoso, el que más tiempo lleva y el más delicado de todos. Lo más importante de limpiar la angula es que pierda esa merma para que no deje ese mal sabor que deja esa cambia la textura y el sabor totalmente de la angula. Metemos agua hirviendo cuando ya empieza a quedar blanca. Sacamos la angula y directamente la pasamos a frío para terminar para cortar la cocción. Esa textura que tiene la angula, una textura blanda con Combinando el ajo y el picante, es una explosión de sabores en la boca. Despite the proliferation of gulas, in the last few years, real angulas have enjoyed increased popularity. The first day auctions generate a lot of buzz, with chefs arriving from all over Spain to make their bids. La demanda en este primer día de subasta ha, ha subido. Hay, hay muchos más compradores en estos últimos 10 años eh, y están dispuestos a pagar mucho más por ese primer, por ese primer kilo de, de, de angula. Baby eels have become so popular that overfishing and smuggling are serious risks. In 2017, Spanish police uncovered an international trafficking operation headed for China, which included 2 million euros worth of angulas. But it's unclear if the seasons to come will be able to support this rise in demand. The European eel is listed as critically endangered, and fewer and fewer baby eels arrive at the beaches of Riva de Seja each year. Llevo hacía 33 años eh, que no perdí, no perdí, no perdí ninguno. Y sí, sí es cierto que si miras a los años de, de atrás, de 10, de 15, de 20 años, las capturas, las capturas bajaron, bajaron, bajaron. Eh, también bajaron los, los pescadores. There are different theories for this decline, including climate change, habitat deterioration, pollution, and overfishing. But for Manolo, fishing angulas is not about money. Pues la verdad que a mí la, la pesca de la angula me encanta. Eh, son muchos años y, y ya desde cuando, desde pequeñín, que iba con mi padre, con, con, 13, con 13 añinos, 12 añinos, eh, ya, ya empecé a, a disfrutar porque me gustaba la pesca. A ver, yo me encanta estar aquí. To produce one pound of coffee beans, farmers need to harvest more than 1,500 of these cherries. Each one contains two seeds that will be sorted, processed, and roasted before they reach your cup. In 2022, the average US price for a pound of coffee was $5.89. But there's a specialty category called single-origin coffee that can easily cost over $30 per pound. 
Some exclusive harvests cost over $80 per pound. So what makes this coffee so special? And why is it so expensive? It's November in Nyeri County, Kenya, and the coffee harvest is in full swing. There are over 12.5 million coffee farms in the world. Almost 95% are owned by smallholders like Joseph. He runs a one-acre farm, part of which he inherited from his parents. Coffee is all about equality. If you produce coffee with a higher quality, the higher prices you get for your coffee. Coffee grows differently depending on the altitude, climate, soil and sun. Farms here sit around 1,700 metres above sea level in rich volcanic soil. The coffee grows very slow, they take long time to mature, and the longer coffee takes time to mature, the better the quality. Almost everywhere, every farmer is growing coffee. High altitude coffee produces fruity and floral flavours. Drinking coffee brewed from beans exclusively from one region ensures that those distinct flavours come through. It's what's called single origin coffee. The quality and unique taste are the biggest reasons it can cost so much. But achieving that quality isn't easy. The terrain here is too uneven for machines, so farmers pick the coffee by hand, one cherry at a time. For coffee, ripeness is key. Mary has been growing coffee for over 25 years. I inherit kutoka kwa mbambu. Iko na miaka kama 50 something. Each branch has ripe and unripe cherries, so she has to pay close attention while picking. The way coffee is harvested here in Kenya is very different from how it's done in Brazil, the world's largest coffee producer. On huge farms with flat terrain, the harvest is mechanized. The trees are at a lower elevation and the yields are higher. Mechanized production is more efficient, but this efficiency can hurt quality control. When the whole tree is picked at once, ripe and unripe cherries are lumped together. This is commodity coffee, destined for mass production and industrial use. Its price is low and volatile. The highest quality coffee is called specialty coffee. This coffee has unique attributes that expert tasters, called Q-graders, rate the highest. Single origin coffee is often rated at the highest end of specialty coffee because of its distinct flavours. Both specialty coffee and a lot of commodity coffee come from the same plant, Caffea arabica. But not all arabica coffee is created equal. This can of ground coffee is 100% arabica. It costs around $8 a pound. In 2022, a single origin coffee grown in Panama sold for over $6,000 a pound at auction, also 100% Arabica. The better the flavor and the smaller the harvest, the more expensive the coffee. Back at Mary's farm, there's still work to be done. After harvesting, workers sort the cherries to weed out any defects. These negatively impact the flavor and lower the price of the coffee. but they need to work quickly. Processing coffee soon after harvest is key to maintaining its quality. Processing infrastructure is expensive, so most farms in Kenya share centralized facilities. Over a thousand farmers from the region bring their coffee here. Each processing method has a different impact on taste, but they all have the same end goal. Separate the seed from the fruit. These are the five stages of coffee processing. The red cherry, the wet parchment, dry parchment, green coffee, and roasted coffee beans. This is the washed process. 
It's the most common way to process coffee in Kenya. After weighing and inspecting the coffee, workers remove the outer skin in a process called depulping. Then they place it in fermentation tanks where it rests for 12 to 14 hours. Fermentation breaks down the mucilage, the sticky inner layer of the fruit, so it can be washed away. The next day, workers push coffee through a series of channels, cleaning off the seeds. This is also where one of several grading processes takes place. Workers separate lower quality, less dense beans, which float to the surface. Even though these beans sell for less, they still provide important income to producers. The denser coffee flows to soaking tanks to ensure any remaining mucilage is removed. Once the seed is free, the coffee flows out of the tanks and onto drying tables. Roasters sell coffee either as a blend of beans from different countries or a single origin. But there's no officially agreed upon definition of the term. It can refer to a farm, a cooperative, or a country. Consumers who buy this type of coffee are usually seeking a particular flavor or aroma. The costs of processing, transportation, and running a roasting business are all bundled into the price customers pay for coffee. It's so expensive to get coffee here. Everything from the farm to the port, everything has gone up. The boxes where we ship your coffee for subscriptions or at home consumption, that packaging has gone up. With single origin, single producer, when you have the producer's name, it's an indicator that we paid more for that coffee because of the relationship. If you're paying in the range of 21 to 26 dollars, it's because we've invested in these areas that are important to us and we hope are important to them. Companies like Metric play an important role in the coffee supply chain. Most coffee is consumed outside of the country it's produced in. And how coffee is roasted has a big impact on its taste. Getting the best flavor out of single origin coffee requires careful roasting. Coffee is roasted in big machines like this. Roasters take green coffee and heat it evenly to develop its flavor. This is 20 pounds of Costa Rican honey processed coffee from Solis y Cordero, which is a husband and wife team in Terra Zoo. Hara uses sight, smell, and sensors to track how the roast is developing. Finding the ideal roast level for each coffee is a skill that takes years to master. This tool that I'm using is called the trier, and it allows us to see the color of the development as we go through the roast, and also to smell how the coffee is smelling. The green coffee will smell kind of like hay or grass. You'll smell it get sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. You can smell some of that acidity come out. It'll smell almost vinegary-ish. As soon as that vinegar starts to fade just a little bit and there's a sweet fruitiness and a sweet baked goodness, that's our finished development. Metric roasts coffee for an average of 11 minutes before Hara releases it into the cooling tray to stop the roasting process. By comparison, commodity coffee roasters favor a darker roast, which can cover up defects and make a blend of beans from different countries taste more uniform. While dark roasts are generally bitter, medium and light roasts offer more sweetness and bright acidity. You can blast it for a minute, and a lot of commodity coffee is just blasted as quick as possible, but it really rushes through all of those phases that develop all of the flavors, going through those steps to get exactly the best qualities out of that coffee. We don't add anything to coffee. Everything was intrinsically there as the raw product from the farmer, from the growing conditions. Light roasts also highlight the unique flavors of a region, allowing two single origin coffees to taste very different. The tricky part about single origin versus blend is that you can achieve stellar results with blends and sometimes really subpar with single origin. And the same thing can be the other way around. How a coffee is processed can have a big impact on its flavor and price. The washed process produces delicious coffee, but it's expensive and can be wasteful. We use a lot of water, and there is a many challenges how to dispose that waste water. 
but we are trying to work on it by recycling the water we are using. After spreading out the coffee, workers move it to a clean set of tables, where they continuously turn it by hand. This coffee takes around 14 days to reach a desired moisture content of 11 to 12 percent. The goal is uniform beans free of defects. Coffee at this stage is called parchment coffee because of the paper-like layer of material that surrounds the seed. Before producers ship the coffee, they mill it to remove the parchment. This is a small machine used for local consumption. When milling large quantities, the coffee goes through another round of grading. Each country has its own methods of grading. In Kenya, each bean is classified by size. The shape and color of the bean also impact the grade, but often the larger, denser beans are the most expensive. After months of work, producers are left with what's called green coffee. This is the product that will be exported and roasted in consuming countries. But this is also when the process becomes more opaque. Farmers don't always know how much a buyer pays an exporter, so they don't know if they're being cut out of potential profit. The benchmark for the price of Arabica coffee follows what's called the sea market. It's an exchange, like the stock market, where traders buy and sell contracts based on the expected future value of coffee. But it doesn't consider the quality of the coffee. And the price is volatile, which makes it hard for farmers to operate sustainably. In 2019, the average closing price was $1.02 per pound. Its lowest point that year, 87 cents. Despite inflation and increased cost of production, the sea market is almost the same as it was in 1980. Joseph is able to operate profitably, but that isn't the case for many farmers around the world. A 2019 study found that 44% of smallholder coffee farmers were living in poverty. Specialty coffee is bought at a premium above the commodity price. Joseph makes around $3.18 a pound. Due to the high quality of our coffee, there is a lot of demand. But our expectation is that the demand should go with higher prices. He says $4.55 a pound would be more sustainable, but his prices have actually decreased over the past few years. I don't know the reason why. Mostly we are told the world market has flooded the coffee, but we still need more explanation on why the coffee is going down when we are still trying our best to maintain our quality coffee. For those who are producing less than five kilos from one tree, they are not even breaking even. The effort we make to produce that quality coffee, I can say we are not well compensated by those prices. Growing coffee requires steep investments, which don't always pay off for farmers. Kasi ya kahawa ni ngumu ukiwa hana pesa. Lakini ukiwa na pesa si ngumu. Many roasters in the industry are working towards direct trade partnerships that benefit the coffee producer. I'm looking to do two things, source high quality coffees, but also establish year over year relationships. Some roasters also publish the prices they pay for green coffee, but the level of transparency varies. We as roasters need to do our job to educate consumers as to the difference between a product from Colombia that's sourced barely the sourced with full transparency in a product of Colombia that has no traceability and is cheap. If it's cheap coffee, that means that somebody in the supply chain is not making it and it's, chances are it's gonna be the producer. They're the ones that lost. At retail, coffee from this region of Kenya has sold for $22.50 for a 12 ounce bag. That's over nine times what the farmers are paid. But just comparing those two numbers doesn't tell the whole story. Even when producers are paid a premium, there will always be a markup between coffee cherries and roasted coffee. Roasters typically pay more for single origin coffee, but there's no definitive premium. The real truth of it is that you can buy coffee at commodity pricing that actually meets specialty standards. For so long, 
the market has been so low and then the quality has been so high that producers need to sell their coffee. They need to earn a living because if they're not earning enough to cover the cost of production, not earning enough to just meet the minimum requirements to have a decent way of life, they're gonna be edged out. That is what's happening all over the world. Many throughout the specialty coffee industry are working towards more transparency, better pay for producers, and more access to research and best practices. Ultimately, when coffee prices are low, the producers are the ones hurt the most. If boiled just right, this clear, transparent juice will turn into a thick, gooey syrup. This process is the basis of making banella, a type of unrefined raw sugar. Banella is beloved in Colombia, where it's commonly consumed in place of processed white sugar. But this sweet nectar doesn't come cheap. In the US, it can cost 20 times more than white sugar. And in Colombia, depending on where it's made, panela can cost up to 17,000 pesos per kilogram. The purest form of panela is made by the indigenous communities of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, the highest coastal mountain range in the world. Here, long distances, high temperatures, and limited resources make panela much more valuable than any other type of sugar. So, how is wild panela made? And is this what makes it so expensive? La panela pues está hecha de puro la guarda de la caña y pues con eso es que nos tomamos y eso hace que nos, nuestro cuerpo eh, dé mucho más energía. Digamos que nos endulzamos. This is Antonio. He's a Kogi, one of the four indigenous communities of the Sierra Nevada. To make panela, Antonio uses a sugar mill made out of wood. El trapiche está construido de, de unos palos que es fino nada más eh, para eso. Ese palo, algo se llama nema. Using this mill is hard work. It takes three people to keep it running. Two push the cane into the mill, while another one directs the mule that powers it. In todos casos, pues todo es un poco difícil. Tenemos que estar pendiente de lo que estamos haciendo, porque muchas veces el trapiche nos ha hecho, digamos, que daño por por el descuido, digamos que estamos metiendo la caña ahí y uh, por el descuido le podemos meter la mano y moler con la mano y eso sí es muy peligroso. In order to extract sugar from the cane juice, Antonio and the others boil it along with water. It took Antonio and the others two hours to extract enough sugar cane juice to fill this pot. He uses dried sugar cane to fuel the fire. Después de echarle ahí, toca esperar que se que se calienta y todas las de toda la suciedad, eh, todos los que contienen o sea, sucio se amonta arriba para poder recogerla. The juice boils quickly and at very high temperatures, so hot that some of the sugar caramelizes. During the boiling process, the juice is constantly stirred and pushed to the bottom of the pot where the temperature is higher. Antonio then removes the water, revealing the sugar at the bottom of the pot. At this stage, when the sugar has a thick, gooey texture, it is called honey. Pues, es muy dulce, delicioso, sabe. Además, es un poco eh, gelatinoso y chicloso. Y pues, se siente como exquisito. Antonio scrapes it off and pours it into these molds where it will rest for a few hours and become panela. 
Milling sugarcane and boiling its juice like this preserves the molasses naturally present in the sugarcane, which is usually removed in refined white sugar or removed and added back in in brown sugar. The molasses gives the panela a more complex caramel flavor and makes it richer in minerals and vitamins. But this can only happen if the weather is right. Today, the weather is a bit too hot, so the honey needs to be bottled and transported to another village at a higher altitude to harden correctly. When the panela is dry, it is sold in one kilogram portions like this one. With 10 buckets of sugarcane, Antonio can get 12 panelas. Pues la panela es tradicional desde siempre. Eso pues aprendemos desde la infancia. Digamos que pues vemos nuestro padre cuando nacemos eh, mirándolo pues eh, moliendo la caña y pues uno colabora. Digamos que a seguir atrás al mulo para que le pueda echarle y pues así aprendemos y ya but it's not just the process that makes panela different from other types of sugar. It's the sugar cane it comes from. Por eso aquí en la Sierra Nevada, habemos cuatro étnicos lo que lo que consumimos la panela. Pasa que hoy hay hay cuatro clases de caña. Caña pejota, y cubana, y caña blanca y caña dulce. Agustin has lived here for the last 12 years. He's a local guide, connecting visitors to the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta with his native gorgi traditions. Y no se puede cortar así como cuando así. Tiene que limpiárselo así. Hay que limpiar. ¿Por qué? Para que se haga limpio en la caña. Y ya está aquí cortado. Que esto hay que dejarlo para la próxima. Esto. Pues no puede cortar todo. Esto. No, hay que dejar siempre uno como cinco cañas así, como este tamaño. White sugar cane is native to this area of the Sierra Nevada and is what the corgi community uses for its panela. As he harvests, Agustin also selects the best seeds to make new plants. This is for sembrar. This is the best thing to do for the seed. This is for plantar. This is the seed. This is the best thing. I cut it like this. One, two, three, four. I have here, here, here. I cut it like three pieces. I plant it so that it grows. It takes a whole year for sugarcane to grow, and it heavily depends on the weather. While farmed varieties can rely on a constant supply of water, the sugarcane here in the Sierra Nevada relies on rivers, rainfall, and meltwater from ice caps, making them high in fiber but low in sugar. Farmed varieties, on the other hand, yield more sugar but are low in fiber. The sugarcane here is also very fragile, and proximity to other plants may kill it. Si yo marco con la coca, con la tabaco, si lo corto la caña, comienza a secar, o viene lo, la gusano o comeje. Sí, porque tabaco muy, muy venoso con ese, con ese mata. When he's finished, Agustin will walk to Antonio's mill, where sugarcane will be turned into honey, and then panela, all over again. A medida que se nos, se nos acabe la panela, volvamos a moler. Digamos que si sale cuatro baldes, llega nada más por la mitad de, de una botella que es grande. Y pues si hay, habemos bastante familia, pues se acaba rápido. Both the dry panela and the gooey honey are an essential part of the corgi diet. They are used in drinks like agua panela, an infusion of panela in hot water, but are also consumed on special occasions, like marriages and baptisms. Panela has an advantage over honey. It can be stored for longer, and it can be sold. More recently, and only to those who ask, the community has started selling it. But the moment that Panela leaves the sugar mill, its price rises. 
This is the main road in this part of the Sierra. For Panela producers to find buyers, they have to walk to the closest village, and that can take hours. Viene diferente lugares, distancia una de 10 horas, de 6 horas, de una hora, así. Se no vive así una cercano. The nearest village to Agustin and Antonio is two hours away on foot. Para nosotros hay bajo precio. O sea, 10 panelas está o 20 panelas está 25 mil pesos. Y de acá afuera está 100 mil pesos por la caja. In town, this panela can cost up to 17,000 pesos per kilogram. That's more than four times the price of panela made from farmed sugar cane. But these high prices are exactly what the community wants. In the last few years, the indigenous communities of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta have worked hard to market their product fairly and invest in better infrastructure. The Arhuaco, another one of these four communities, has partnered with the UN and Ecopetrol, a major gas company, to modernize its sugar mills and get a license to sell wild panela abroad. The global rise in fame of panela as a healthy alternative to sugar is also contributing to increased demand. Panela made from farmed sugar canes has reached over $36 per kilogram, while indigenous varieties aren't yet exported. But there is a difference between what is currently available to consumers and the indigenous panela. Colombia is one of the world's top sugarcane producers, producing 2.3 million metric tons of sugarcane annually. Most sugarcane is farmed in giant monoculture plantations and needs excessive amounts of water to survive. According to the UN, sugarcane requires more water than any other crop to reach maturity, more than soy and maize. In the last decade, sugarcane has also been used to make ethanol, which is considered an important biofuel. This has ramped up sugarcane monocultures even more, and sugarcane crops now take up to 60 million acres of land worldwide. The overabundance of panela made from farmed sugarcane diminishes the competitiveness of the wild banana in the market, like the one Antonio and Agustin use here in the Sierra Nevada. But the isolation of the mountains makes keeping panela alive here challenging. In the last few years, snow has almost disappeared from some peaks in the Sierra Nevada. This means no meltwater in the summer, a crucial resource for sugarcane. The warming climate is also making it hard for panela to dry fully, and more and more families are either skipping the drying step and just making honey, which is more perishable and harder to sell, or they're moving their sugarcane mills to higher, even more remote mountain slopes. This is one of the rarest steaks in the world. Known as olive wagyu, it costs over $500 a pound which is almost 60% more expensive than other high-grade cuts of Wagyu. Produced by feeding Wagyu cows a special feed made from olives, it's one of the most expensive meats you can buy. The technique of feeding olives to Wagyu cows was actually only developed in recent decades. And the steak wasn't always this pricey.
So what makes olive wagyu different from other wagyu? And why is it so expensive? The sun is rising over Shodoshima in Japan's inland sea. Masaki Ishii has been raising cattle here for half a century. Shodoshima, literally small bean island, was once famed for its Izuki beans. But after olive trees were introduced from Greece just over a century ago, it became more famous as the home of Japan's oldest olive groves. Wagyu beef is already known for its intense marbling and high levels of oleic acid, both of which make the meat extra tender and flavorful. Masaki set out to create a wagyu even richer in oleic acid. で、but, instead of using fresh olives, Masaki turned to olive pomace, the residue from olive oil production. Doing so allowed him to recycle a waste product from one of Shodoshima's major industries. Olive Olive pomace still contains a lot of oil. Drying it is a difficult and costly process, one that took Masaki almost six years to perfect. さん、朝昼晩天日干しで、え、手で植えした、ま、Around two months before the cattle is shipped out, Masaki starts mixing the dried pomace into their feed every day. Every morning, Masaki comes in to check on his cows while they're still asleep. While other varieties of Wagyu are typically sold to be processed at 24 to 26 months, olive Wagyu doesn't ship out until 30 months. The longer raising time and high cost of the feed make olive Wagyu difficult to come by, but despite the limited supply, it has become especially popular with chefs. The 
、えー、当レストランのシグニチャーディッシュとして用意させていただいてますのは、えー、オリーブビーフになっております前菜からメインまで、えー、全ての皿にオリーブビーフを使いますお値段は3万円から3万5千円ぐらいで今のところ計画しています、えー、オリーブビーフなんですけれども最近は出回る量も少なくなってきました人気が世界中で上がってきたみたいで、えー、値段も一緒に上がってきている印象があります When Masaki first started experimenting with olives, he kept it a secret from his buyers. 私一人で始めてで黙って市場へ出荷しておりましたらそしたら市場の一番の社長さんに専務が、えー、食べて生肉を食べまして。これ非常に美味しい牛肉に変わったぞと初めて褒めていただけてこれはいけるなと思いまして But in 2010, an outbreak of foot and mouth disease in Miyazaki Prefecture devastated Japan's livestock industry. Despite successful efforts to contain the disease locally, the damage was done. Countries like the United States suspended beef imports from Japan. Disaster struck again with the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami of 2011. As Japan struggled to recover and rebuild its economy, Masaki looked towards strengthening his prefecture's beef production. He led the charge towards working with more local olive farmers. In 2012, other farmers on Shodoshima started following Masaki's methods to raise olive fed cattle. Just one year later, olive wagyu began shipping to places outside of Shodoshima and Kagawa Prefecture. Today, there are about 2,500 olive fed cattle on Shodoshima. Still, this is nothing compared to places like Kagoshima or Miyazaki, where high quality wagyu production has been taking place for decades. On Masaki's farm, there are just 20 head of cattle. To reach this goal, the cattle farmers of Shodoshima need help from the local olive producers. The olive industry has a merit. The olive i もう諦めんとこれを絶対ものにしたい成功させたい科学のものにしたいという気力が非常にありましたバービス・チョウドリーと妻シュシーラー continuously churn these bellonas for up to an hour if they stop for even a second this batch of ghee will be ruined Bilona ghee is clarified butter that's hand churned using a certain type of wooden beater called a bilona and made from the milk of South Asian cow breeds. In general, ghee is more expensive than traditional butter, and in India, ghee made this way can cost over three times as much as factory made ghee. But there are plenty willing to pay the price. जो घी की इम्पोर्टेंस है वो ऐसी है कि एक कहावत है कि घी खाओ चाहे कर्ज लेकर खाओ सो वाई हिज दिस घी रिजन टू द टॉप एंड वाई इज इट सो एक्सपेंसिव घी इज अ स्टेपल ऑफ साउथ एशियन कुकिंग इट्स कॉमनली ईटन ऑन चपाती लेंटल्स वॉइस एंड मोर अगर घी नहीं खाएंगे तो अपनी दादी नानी अपने को फटकार लगाएगी बिकॉज ऑफ द क्लैरिफिकेशन प्रोसेस Ghee's flavor is nuttier and more concentrated than butter. But aside from taste, there are practical reasons to choose ghee over butter. Without any milk solids, ghee can be stored for a longer time without spoiling. Plus, it has a higher smoke point than butter, which means it's better suited for cooking at high temperatures. Making this nutty, nutritious ghee requires time, specialized equipment, and happy cows. Barvish's process starts at 5 30 in the morning in Rajasthan, India. Whereas most butter is made by churning cream, this type of ghee is made like cheese. 
by separating curds and whey from milk. The cream method is mechanized and is what's used commercially to make a lot of ghee quickly. Whereas the Bilona method is done completely by hand. On Barvish's farm, he and his team need 30 hours to produce just one kilogram of ghee. Good ghee requires a good pot, which Barvish must select with his ears. According to Barvish, a good pot rings like a bell, while a low quality one has invisible flaws that make it sound flat. <laughs> तो देखो ये उतने ज्यादा अच्छे से नहीं बज रहा क्योंकि इसमें इसकी जो क्वालिटी हो रोल बनावट जो है उसकी उतनी ज्यादा मजबूत है नहीं इसमें The perfect pot is important because the entire process from raw milk to ghee takes place inside it After heating the milk from morning to night and then letting it cool until the next day he adds a starter to the milk to jump start the curdling process. जमन लगाने के लिए हम थोड़ा सा खट्टा दही या थोड़ी सी खट्टी छाछ काम में लेते हैं। तो उस टाइम पे दूध का टेम्परेचर एप्रोक्स 45 डिग्री सेल्सियस होना चाहिए। उस सही तापमान पे ही दूध का दही जमेगा। और रात बेरे के लिए हम उन मटकों को ढककर छोड़ देते हैं। The ghee is left to culture. Fermenting the milk in this way allows the ghee to develop complex flavors not commonly found in other types of butter. ये देखिए सुबह का टाइम है और अभी जो अपना दही है एकदम परफेक्ट जमकर तैयार हो रखा है। अब इसमें थोड़ा सा हम गरम पानी डालके इसका बिलोना करेंगे। Using rope and a post for stability, Barvish and Shushila twist the bilona back and forth to agitate the curd. इसमें लंबा प्रोसेस रहता है, थोड़ा सा पेशेंस रखना पड़ता है। The Bilona method goes back thousands of years, and the tools haven't changed much. It only takes around two hours to make a Bilona by hand from shisham wood, but you have to be in the right place to buy one. Barvish sources new Bilonas from elders in the village. को उनको नॉलेज होता है बनाने का क्योंकि लकड़ी को जब अपन घुमाते हैं तो उस वो लकड़ी भी एकदम सीधी होनी चाहिए अगर उसमें बैंड होगा तो अच्छे से नहीं घूमेगी और नीचे जब उसके चार पंखुड़ियां होती हैं तो चारों का भी बैलेंस होना चाहिए While the bilona is in use the wood absorbs oil from the key This helps to preserve the tool and extend its life जो बिलोना लकड़ी हम काम में ले रहे हैं ये तो मेरे बचपन से भी पहले की है। It takes about an hour of continuous churning to separate the butter from the buttermilk। और उसके बाद में अपने को ठंडा पानी डालना पड़ता है लास्ट में और फिर अपना जो मक्खन है वो पूरा अच्छी तरह से ऊपर तैरने लगता है। The result of all that churning is this मक्खन or cultured butter to turn it into ghee. Barvish heats it up again. Oiling the butter clarifies it, which means the liquid is separate from the milk solids. The longer he cooks the ghee, the nuttier the aroma and deeper its golden color. The sweet spot is usually around one to two hours. What's left in the pot is Bilona ghee, ready to be shipped out and eaten. But only after a blessing from Shushila, लस्सी को ऐसे नमस्कार करते हैं सूर्य से कि ये भगवान हमें लस्सी दी है ऐसे हमें लस्सी सभी को दे अच्छा घी दे अच्छा दूध लस्सी दे। Barvish and his family have made ghee for generations, but in 2020 he took his business online. In 2022, the global ghee market peaked at 49.2 billion dollars. Some estimates expect that number to hit $73.5 billion by 2028. And demand for a product like Barvish's continues to grow as well, even when it can cost around three times as much as the industrial version. That's because his ghee comes from these indigenous cows. All of these cows are South Asian breeds, popularly known as desi cows. 
A desi cow produces about 10 to 12 liters of milk a day. That's half as much as industrial cows, and nothing can happen if a calf isn't around. But Barvish says the quality of their milk makes up for the lower yield. देसी गाय का जो दूध रहता है वो काफी गाढ़ा रहता है उसमें फैट कंटेंट ज्यादा रहता है और जो खाने में जो मिठास आती है वो ज्यादा मिलती है It takes over 20 liters of milk to make just 1 liter of ghee So when demand is high Barvish buys milk from other farmers in the village to keep up Ghee made using Barvish's methods from the milk of indigenous cows is often marketed as A2 desi ghee a2 refers to a specific type of protein found in milk, beta casein. While milk from Western dairy cows contains both A1 and A2 beta casein, milk from desi cows only contains the A2 protein. In researching what this difference means, a 2016 study found that A2 milk was easier for people with lactose intolerance to digest. <laughs> For many of Barvish's customers, the difference between A1 and A2 ghee is an Ayurvedic and religious one. Barvish's biggest orders come from cities nationwide, but they are a long way from his remote village. गांव से शहर के लिए डायरेक्ट कोई कोरियर सर्विस मिलना मतलब थोड़ा सा चैलेंजिंग रहता है बट डिस्पाइट द लॉजिस्टिकल चैलेंजेस बाविश लाइक्स द वर्क उसमें कोई टफ पार्ट नहीं है उसमें मजा आता है सुबह के टाइम में एक तो अपनी अच्छी खासी एक्सरसाइज हो जाती है अपना पसीना भी निकल जाता है बॉडी का और हेल्थी बनी रहती है हेल्थ बनी रहेगी एक्सरसाइज हो जाएगी जिम जाने की जरूरत नहीं है और अच्छा घी निकल के आएगा अपने को squeezing every last drop, stirring for hours, and seesawing all night. This is Korean rice syrup, and this is what it takes to make it. Young Woon and his daughter Sujin are extracting the main ingredient of rice syrup, shikyo, a mixture of steamed rice, hot water, and barley malt. <laughs> The delicate process behind shikya gives rice syrup an incomparable sweetness, but also brings the price up. A one kilogram bottle of artisanal rice syrup can reach $140. So how long does it actually take to make shikya? And is this why rice syrup is so expensive? Young Goon runs a workshop with his daughter Su Jin in Changpyeong, South Chara Province, South Korea. In 2000, the South Korean Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs named him the 21st Grand Master for his expertise in rice syrup and rice taffy. <laughs> The key step in making high-quality rice syrup is to ferment cooked rice with barley malt. The rice ferments for 10 hours under a blanket to minimize temperature change. This sweet solution is called shikye. 
이게 이제 식혜가 다 됐거든요. 식혜가 다된 거를 바발로 이렇게 확인을 합니다. 이렇게. 이렇게. 그러면 따르 이렇게 말려요. 그냥 바발이 깨져가지고. 이렇게. 근데 이렇게 바발이 깨지지 않으면 식혜가 덜된 거예요. Quicker fermentation methods that use artificial enzymes exist, but the rich, complex flavors produced by Young Goon's longer method are what sets his rice syrup apart from mass produced alternatives. In South Korea, there is a big difference between artisanal rice syrup made with shikke and the one made with artificial enzymes. Artisanal syrup can be as much as three times as expensive. While premium artisanal syrup like Young Goon's costs up to six times as much. To separate the shikya from the rice, Young Goon and Sujin wrap the rice in a hemp bag and then drain the liquid through a bamboo plank. To extract the last drops of shikye, Yang Gun and Su Jin sit on the plank and seesaw on it. They have to work at night if they want to make rice syrup in the morning. 힘들죠. 힘들면 저녁에 2시나 일어나 가지고 이제 엿을 짜기 시작하고 그렇습니다. 식혜를 다 됐으면. 잘때 짜니까 이게 시소를 타요. 이렇게 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 이렇게. 그럼 시소를 타게 되면 한 사람이 좋으면 한 사람이 넘어져. 넘어지면 나도 같이 넘어지죠. 근데 그게 참 재밌는 에피소드. <웃음> 또 털어. 메이킹 시케 is much more than seesawing. It can only be made if the rice is cooked properly. 손으로 딱 쥐면은 딱 뭉쳐져요. 그러면서 조금 있으면 이제 들러붙고 이런 현상이 있을 때 가장 좋습니다. 뚜껑 여세요. 제가 여기 있을게요. 영군 and Sujin steam the rice in an iron pot. Before pouring the rice, they wrap the pot in cloth to prevent the steam from leaking. 쭉 당기면서요. 요거 빈틈을 잘 막아야지 안 그러면 밥이 설릴 거야. 아, 이제 피어버려. 쫙 피어버려. 쫙 쌓아버려. 음. The rice cooks for one and a half to two hours. Young Gun and Su Jin constantly check the fire to make sure the rice cooks evenly. To make one kilogram of syrup, Young Gun needs five times the amount of rice. In other parts of South Korea, different types of traditional syrup exist, made from corn or sweet potatoes. But here in South Chara province, rice is an important resource and is the preferred choice to make syrup. Compared to other cereals, rice is much more difficult to process. To ferment and become shikke, it needs this. Sprouted barley. Young Goon cultivates it here on rotation with rice. 내가 엿을 만들기 위해서 보리를 싹을 기르는 것을 엿질금이라 그래요. 이 조청을 만들기 위해서는 제일 중요한 것이 쌀도 중요하지만 엿기름 기르는 것이 가장 중요하다 이렇게 되죠. 이게 보리의 싹인데요. 
이 보리의 싹이 얼마나 컸느냐에 따라 갖고 식이 엿기름 가장 좋은 엿기름의 성질이 변해요. 요게 이제 단맛을 좌우하고 식혜나 어, 또 조청의 맛을 좌우하고 질을 좌우하고 그래요. Young Goon is looking for a length of one centimeter to one and a half centimeters. This length can take up to ten days to achieve, and the barley needs to be rinsed and checked daily. This is what truly sets apart his rice syrup. Less premium versions of rice syrup are made with shorter sprouts, so the barley holes can be repurposed after the malt is extracted. Why do they grow? If they grow, the water in the barley is all gone. Young Woon mixes the barley sprouts with water and, with the help of Su Jin, squeezes the barley to extract the malt. After 10 hours of fermentation and a long night of seesawing, the shikke is finally ready to be cooked down into a syrup. Young Woon uses a traditional iron pot called a komosut which gives richness to the syrup. Kamasote, or it don't a cricket them as hecari purgojinda. Grugonje, Kamasosianico, Chiquari Ragrio, Chiquari Anigo, Kanjam Yolo is a cricket demon, Secari Hayacho. The Chiquire Hoga demon, Kamaso is still to oil. A pot like this can cost up to one million won. Kamaso son, Pumonim Tevuta, to Halmani Tevuta. 내가 3대째 하고 있는데요. 내 전수작가의 4대째 합니다. 근데 3대를 계속 이렇게 가마솥사가 해서 끓여요. 채로 따질 수가 없죠. Because the pot retains so much heat, Yungun must monitor the fire at all times, as well as stir the syrup constantly. If something goes wrong and the heat is too strong, the syrup may burn. If stirred too long, its texture will harden. 그러니까 이걸 이제 퍼내야 돼요. 네, 계속 두 시간 반 동안 이렇게 저어줘야 됩니다. 왜 저지 않으면은 바닥에 누러 붙어요 곡물이라. 아또 불이 안 나온다. 이거 조금 이따가 해야 되는데. 이 can take up to three hours to reach the right consistency. 이, 이 상태에서 봐요. 이, 이, 이게 이제 이 상태에서 봅니다. 마지막 이 상태에서 물이 똑 떨어지잖아요. 네, 이렇게 똑 떨어지는 상태. 네, 이 상태. 근데 이 상태가 조청으로서는 가장 좋고 위에서 더 수분을 농축해서 만들게 되면 이제 여시 만들어요. Just like the komosu, the container where the syrup is stored is important. This type of pot is called ongi, and a large one like this can cost 750,000 won. 그래서 어, 자체 증발도 시키면서 공기도 흡수하고 이런 여러 가지 영향도 있겠지만은 While the process is lengthy, customers are recognizing its value and the demand for rice syrup is increasing. Companies outside of South Korea have started making rice syrup and the global industry is expected to exceed 1 billion dollars in 2032. And while large scale consumption of processed sugar is hurting rice syrup in the local Korean market, the syrup has gained popularity abroad. In the US, premium syrups can reach $140 per kilogram. But rice syrup is different from other sweeteners. 설탕이나 물엿은 그 순간적인 단맛에 집중하는 그런 그 인공 감미료잖아요. 근데 조청은 어, 깊은 맛을 냄과 동시에 사람 몸을 이롭게 하기 위해서 만든 식재료거든요. Because rice syrup tastes less sweet than table sugar, you would need larger quantities to match sugar's sweetness when cooking. 
Rice syrup also has a higher glycemic index, so using it as a direct substitute for sugar could actually do more harm than good. But making rice syrup alone isn't enough for workshops like Yangoon's to survive. Rice syrup is the main ingredient in hangwa, a general term for Korean confectionaries. But most of all, the syrup is the base for yut, a type of rice taffy which is in high demand locally. Taffy can be stored for longer than raw syrup can. But it's challenging to make. <laughs> it's boiled for six hours, is much stickier than syrup, and must be stretched like this over 30 times. Yangun and Sujin always work in pairs. Here in Tamyang, Yangun is determined to keep the tradition alive. This is Gumpot Pepper, the champagne of pepper. From one tree, farmers produce four different colors. Compared to common black pepper, Gumpot Pepper offers a stronger flavor and aroma. Chefs and locals describe it as pungent, fruity, and citrusy. Online, a kilo of black gumbot peppercorns can cost over $70. The rarest white peppercorns can cost over $100 per kilogram. The wholesale price of regular black pepper from Cambodia is less than $4 per kilogram. <laughs> Voon, like his father before him, is a pepper farmer. He follows strict requirements so that he can sell his pepper as gumpot. If everything goes well, there could be big profits. But this year won't be easy. Voon could lose half of his harvest and the profits that come with it. So what does the future have in store for this rare pepper? And why is it so expensive? Only pepper grown in these specific areas of southern Cambodia can be sold as gumpot. In 2016, the European Union awarded pepper grown here and in neighboring Kep province a protected geographical indication. A PGI states that the environmental factors of this region make the pepper unique, like real champagne or Darjeeling tea. For farmers like Voon, the price premium from the PGI is essential. Growing pepper is hard work. Even on large farms, workers pick each cluster by hand. The berries are small, and vines can grow over five meters tall. Chẳng tấu, dân bay lườn, nàng ấy dân bay về dân 
phải về lại tới ở đây đập chân tôm tập bay chẳng là vì dư tới nắng Green peppercorns have a fresh citrusy flavor but they're not as spicy as the other colors depending on how long berries stay on the vine and how they're processed farmers produce either black red or white pepper and while there is demand for green peppercorns workers can't just pick everything all at once Picking too early means pepper can't be used for the more valuable red and white peppercorns. The longer a pepper stays on the vine, the more it ripens, developing the flavor. Bị cáu, chẳng nhớ thay bị cáu lại sẽ bỏ về bài em tê. Hôm nay đó là về cái nóng hầu, 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 khăng mà lấy bát bát đi, hầu khăng nè. <laughs> the demand for compote pepper outside of Cambodia grew in the late 19th century when French colonists started exporting it to Europe. Compote pepper is so special that nobody can really just use a word to describe the whole thing but to me compote pepper is it's intense it's spicy it's pungent it has a very very beautiful fragrance that's very important but another thing that is special about it also is about the coloring that it stay beautiful and fresh so long long time For me, you know, growing up in Cambodia and use a compote pepper all my life, and then um, use other um, pepper, it's almost like I'm using the pepper that is not peppery, <laughs> but it's also a bit earthy and not as pungent and also not fragrant. It's it's very very hard to compare. So the process of roasting it helps the peppers to spread out the aroma, and that also make our dish very fragrant and beautiful. So we're gonna be adding a few rows of this fresh and green peppercorn. Ooh, beautiful, really beautiful. Okay. For me, um, cooking amazing Cambodian uh, cuisine, it starts from each individual ingredients. So peppercorn is one of them, but Cambodia has a lot more to tell through food. Last year, Boon harvested around 500 kilos, but this year he might not even get half of that. Using natural fertilizer and no harmful pesticides are two of several certification requirements Voon must follow. And Voon says if farmers don't follow these rules, they could be kicked out of the association. អាការដែលគេដាក់កំណត់ឬក៏គេឲ្យយើងធ្វើនេះយើងពេញចិត្តធ្វើដោយខ្លួនឯងផលិតផលថោតែមានគុណភាពសុភុំទុកអត់មា
Back at Voon's house, he sorts the pepper by ripeness and removes any defects. Careful, clean sorting is also part of maintaining certification. After sorting, Voon and his family wash the peppercorns, then they lay them out on raised beds to dry. As the pepper ripens, it turns from green to yellow to red. Each colour peppercorn undergoes a different process, and each has its own culinary use. Farmers dry yellow-green pepper into black peppercorns, which have a strong spiciness and aroma. Their taste is more floral compared to unripe green pepper. Red peppercorns are sweeter and have a fruitier aroma. Chefs also use them in some desserts. To get white peppercorns, Vroom boils the ripe berries and removes the skin by hand. Locals describe the taste as pungent, with notes of fresh grass, lime, and even anise. Chefs also use white peppercorns to avoid black speckles in sauces. To remove the skin, Boone presses the peppercorns against the side of this basket. Finally, Voon is ready to sell his pepper. One of the largest farms in the region is La Plantation. Depending on the year, it grows around 8 to 12 percent of Cambodia's gumpot pepper. One of the owners, Nathalie, doesn't find demand to be an issue. She's optimistic about Gumpot's future. I think every year we, we sell our whole production and we buy a lot from small farmers. I think Gumpot pepper will grow because, uh, you know, tourism also is back, so more and more people are coming back to Cambodia. All the people, when they try Gumpot pepper, you know, they fell in love with uh, Gumpot pepper. So no risk that uh, the demand will, uh, will decrease. La Plantation has access to overseas markets that smaller producers don't. To meet international demand, the company buys and processes pepper from other farmers in the region. What is important for us also is to help the small farmers who cannot access to international market. So we as farmer, producer and exporter, we buy a lot every year of compote pepper from small family farms and they are doing a fantastic pepper, so we are very proud of their pepper and the quality of the, the pepper produced. Large farms have the resources to navigate the fluctuating market and to cash in on the tourist potential of the protected geographical indication. Much like a vineyard, La Plantation has opened its fields to visitors for tours and tastings. But if demand doesn't increase, large farms could make it difficult for smaller farmers to compete. Even in the face of these challenges, Voon says he can weather the competition. ຈັ່ງບໍ່ອາດຖືບານກໍຖືຕໍ່ເພິ່ນຂະນະທໍອາດແມ່ນຈະໄດ້ແມ່ນອີ່ເດວ່າຖ້າອາດຖືບານເອ
Wholesale prices for compote peppercorns range from $15 to $28 per kilo, depending on the color. But prices can reach even higher. La Plantation sells black peppercorns for $50 per kilogram and white and red for $60 per kilogram. Online, it charges almost double that. For comparison, other peppercorns produced in Cambodia sold for around $3.45 per kilogram in 2022. Since earning the geographical indication, Kumpot Pepper's production has increased dramatically from around 16 metric tons in 2010 to over 100 in 2021, although it's still less than 1% of Cambodia's pepper harvest each year. And the wholesale prices of Kumpot Pepper have tripled since 2009, which means more profit for farmers like Foon. The problem is demand. The annual production aims to satisfy tourists and export markets. But recently, there's been oversupply. In 2022, Cambodia exported around 79 metric tons, a 31% drop from the year before. The Kumpot Pepper Promotion Association attributes this slump to a reduction in international spending. This can be a challenge for small farmers. If there isn't enough demand, they might have to sell their pepper below the market price. Some farmers have moved on from pepper production altogether. There has been about a 7% decrease in the number of compote producers since 2019. Even so, the total number of producers is still 70% higher than it was in 2015. Voon's family has been farming pepper for decades. But like many in Cambodia, they had to stop in the 70s during the deadly Khmer Rouge regime. After some time, they were able to start again. Voon's farm now has around 600 vines. <laughs> ក៏យើងអាចចង់យើងថាយើងអាចជីវភាពត្រួតត្រង់ជីវភាពបានខ្លះហើយក៏វាមិនបានយើងចង់យើងថាវាមិនមិនទទួលភាពវាទៅនេ
allowing bees to collect more nectar and pollen than other flowers. It's during this time that the beehive population is largest and most productive, which is ideal for harvesting lots of high-quality royal jelly. Zhuachang traveled 600 kilometers to get here in Sheyang County, Hubei province, to raise his bees. He arrived four months ago, and today he's starting to harvest royal jelly. <laughs> there are three types of bees born in the hive. Workers, which are sterile female bees, drones, the male bees, and queens, which are the fertile female bees. As larvae, all bees grow in these tiny cells and consume royal jelly. But once the queen emerges, only she is allowed to feed on it. Beekeepers like Zhuacheng maximize royal jelly production by removing the queen. He will place it in a separate part of the box, away from the hive. The bees will work quickly to feed all the potential queen larvae. It takes workers 72 hours to fill the larvae cells with jelly. Zhuacheng also creates multiple artificial cells which he fills with fresh larvae taken from other hives. Yuzhongla 他封口了以后呢,他都把封年都吃完了,你都起伏出来多少了。Too much force can destroy larvae or future queens. Zhuacheng needs to keep them alive in the cells so he can get as much jelly as possible from the workers. 或者是把它拿个地方,它那个虫子很小的,很柔软的,你稍微给它碰它一点,都给它碰坏了,那个是它是它是不会接受的。With 64 cells in each strip, Zhu Chang will fill thousands of queen cells throughout the harvest. In exactly 72 hours, Zhuacheng checks on his boxes of hives. He removes the cells from the hives and cuts off the beeswax seal on top of each cell. He needs to remove each larva from inside the jelly-filled cell. Because of the tiny size of the larvae, this task also must be done by hand. <laughs> There are many consumers who also purchase the larvae. In fact, the demand for queen larvae is just as high as royal jelly. He now can sit and delicately collect the royal jelly from inside each cell. To extract one kilogram of royal jelly, Zhuacheng has to empty at least 2,000 queen cells. 
这个它也能产个，一箱蜂也能产四公斤，四公斤蜂王娘，还是还是比较轻松。它这个一年的一箱蜂也取得蜂王娘的产值也能达到两三千块钱。Royal jelly sourced from rapeseed flowers here in Hubei can sell for over two hundred and fifty dollars for a single kilogram abroad. 油菜花蜂王娘是是一等油菜，一等一等王娘。人家直接到家里来拿，它这个蜂蜜吧，你一般的情况下，蜂王娘的这个价格要比蜂蜜的价格要高八到十倍。The reason behind this price discrepancy is their nutrients. Honey is mostly made up of sugar, while royal jelly also contains proteins and other minerals, most still unknown. Being richer in nutrients than honey has linked royal jelly to a variety of health benefit claims, like being an aphrodisiac. Or a key to long life, but most have yet to be confirmed by scientific evidence. These beliefs come from seeing what happens to the bees that consume royal jelly. Queen bees grow one and a half times larger than other bees. They have a lifespan of seven years, while a worker bee lives just six months, and they can lay up to three thousand eggs in a single day, while workers are infertile. But that may not be linked to the lack of royal jelly at all. A study has shown that a worker's diet of honey and pollen contains natural chemicals that make them infertile. <laughs> royal jelly can be found in beehives all over the world, but it's China where 90% of the world's production comes from. Production took off in the 1980s when Chinese beekeepers started using a variety of high-yielding bee called Apis mellifera ligustica spinola. This special breed of royal jelly-yielding honeybees helped ramp up production almost 2,000% over the past 40 years. Zhuocheng has been using these bees since he started beekeeping over 30 years ago. His mission is to be calm. 变异人管理，他这个再一个说，他是养那个蜜蜂，他群是大，他一直就叫着蜜蜂大型蜜源，他才能集中有有有力的兵，那个那个那个那个势力去去采，才能达到那个产量什么的，他要比中华蜜蜂产量高，是这样的，效益要好一点。Regardless of the species, bees are under threat, and because of the great number of larvae killed or eaten. Forcing bees to produce royal jelly has come under scrutiny. While lab-grown royal jelly exists, it does not have the same benefits as the natural product, and it even killed queen bees that fed on it. The changing climate and the use of pesticides on crops are also causing bees' numbers in China to diminish rapidly. If there is a pest, it will kill them directly. That thing is very big for bees. 一群是特别大，去年不是干旱嘛，干旱造成的，把那个蜜蜂群是比较大。Pesticide use has become so rampant in parts of China that some farmers have begun to pollinate by hand. 他你对他不了解的时候，你感觉到哎呀，不就是个蜜蜂嘛？但是你又深入它了解以后，这个东西还是一种神奇的动物，它是一种神奇的动物。现在，因为好像是养这么多年，是不是？哪一天不看见蜜蜂嘛，那心里就不舒服，有一种感觉。嗯，它这个虽说那蜜蜂，虽说它蜇人，它蜇人也疼，还还喜欢，还是还是比较喜欢的这这个这个行业。你房子，慢慢的，虽然它长，它摘人，它咬人，但是我们对它还是很有感情的。